Testament. <laughs> Some of you don't know why I'm saying that, and that's why I know. Maybe I'll tell you. Romans chapter 8, and uh, verse number 1 uh, is going to be our text. Again, we're getting down to the end uh, of this series. There's only two more lessons after this one, and then we will be completely through this series. Uh, I've enjoyed this series a great deal. It's, it's very practical, uh, and it does deal with so many of the things that we all face. Uh, and, and so I think that's a good thing. You know, the Word of God ought to be practical. All we get out of the Word of God is, is platitudes and, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, doctrine. Doctrine's good. That's great. But it all ought to be practical. Uh, you know, so we believe certain doctrines. Well, how do, you, how do you carry that out in your life? How does that come out? And so this, this is good because, again, it's, it's showing the Word of God being the practical book that it is. That it does touch on things that have to do with our everyday life. Rather than just, eh, you know, it's just some good ideas and some myths and stories. You know, it, it's so much more than that. But anyway, Romans chapter 8, verse number 1 will be our text. Let's go ahead and stand together as we read our text. It says, there, uh, there is... Therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you again for uh, each one who's here. We thank you for the, the time now that you've given us that we can look into your word. We pray that you would help us to make good use of this time. Lord, that we would learn from your word, that it would be the help that we need. And uh, Lord, just have your will and way in everything that's said and done, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So we're going to talk about condemnation. And uh, condemnation uh, experienced in a person's life presents a very real and often a perplexing problem. Condemnation is always destructive, whether real or whether imagined. It's, it's whether justified or unjust. It's still destructive. Uh, the subject is one with many aspects, and a few of them we're going to consider. Obviously, we're not going to be able to consider everything. So, let's look at the subject here. Condemnation is defined for us. Uh, the Greek word here uh, signifies, uh, the, this Greek word is what's uh, translated condemnation. It signifies to give judgment against, to pass sentence upon, hence to condemn implying the fact of a crime. And we're going to talk about uh, how that applies, how that definition applies to us. Uh, the English dictionary definition is to pronounce to be utterly wrong, to utter a sentence against, to censure, to blame, it includes the idea of utter rejection. So that's the, the definition of condemnation and what we're talking about. It's to, uh, to give judgment against. It is... To, to blame, it, it is to utterly reject. All of those things uh, are tied together in the idea of condemnation. And so let's, let's look at the discussion of condemnation here. And, and it is a serious discussion because condemnation is synonymous with rejection. Anyone ever felt rejected? That's, and what you feel is the same as if you stood up before a court of law and they said you're guilty. That's the same feeling that you get. Uh, and, and so that's why they're synonymous, rejection as well as condemnation. It, it can be as minor as a social rejection due to ethnic or economic stations, or it can be as major a rejection as sovereign rejection, that is the rejection of God uh, for a sinful man for an eternity. So it's varying levels of uh, condemnation, but we all experience one type or another uh, of that. Condemnation does not cease uh, to be a conflict at the conversion. So when you're saved, you know, sometimes we have the idea, well, if I were to be saved, if I just trust Christ, then all of that's going to be taken out of the way. Boy, if that were true, everybody would get saved. Uh, I mean, it's just true, but that's just not how it is. about those things and so yeah it's a problem we deal with but sometimes it's a problem we give other people 
and we have to be careful about that. So let's look at the sources, because there is scriptural condemnation back over in John chapter 3 and uh, verse number 18. Uh, Jesus says this, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Then over in the, back in the book of Mark chapter 16, Mark chapter 16, we'll read this and then we'll kind of tie these together. Mark 16 and verse 14, Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat in meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So there's a scriptural condemnation. And Jesus said that he's not come to condemn the world, or he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. He's already uh, had the judgment given against him. It's not that uh, unlike uh, what, what is commonly believed. Well, when I die, I'll stand before God and I'll find out if I'm condemned or not. That's not what the scripture teaches. What the scripture teaches is everyone naturally who is not trusted in Christ is condemned. And that's what it says over here in Mark 16. If you've never trusted Christ as your only hope for salvation, you are condemned. Not you will be. Judgment has already been passed. You are condemned right now. So that's scriptural condemnation. Is that wrong? No. Because then you're saying, okay, God's wrong for saying what's true. No. 12. Matthew chapter 12. And really what this is, is condemning the guiltless. And uh, it, it's possible uh, that we can be guilty of that. We can be guilty of condemning the guiltless. You know, uh, we pile on somebody. You know, we see somebody uh, picking on someone else. And telling them, you're wrong. They, no, 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 no. But th this is right. And no, no, you're wrong. And we pile on with them. No, see, you're wrong. You're just wrong. And everyone around is, you know, piling on that person. And, oh, you're so wrong. When they're not. They're not wrong. And we find out later. Oh, they were right. They knew what they were talking about. And, uh, and of course, I mean, far be it from us to go and say, uh, you were right and I was wrong. Our, our pride gets in the way of that. Uh, we can be guilty of that. We can, we can be the one against whom people, you know, just, you know, gather together against us, so it seems. And they pile on us in this social condemnation. Even though we know, we know what we're doing is right. And, and it seems like everybody around says, no, 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 that's wrong. And you shouldn't do that. Matthew 12, verse 1, at that time, Jesus uh, went on the Sabbath day through the corn. And his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was in hunger and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that this place in this place is one greater than the temple. But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would, have con uh, ye would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And so they were doing what was right, but uh, but here you have this social condemnation, and uh, really we have a great deal of that in our society today, social condemnation. So you have uh, uh, people in our society today who tell us that we're wrong for believing certain things and for holding certain ideas based on the Word of God, not based on our prejudice, but based on what God teaches uh, when you think about marriage, there are people who, they would be up in arms about what God says about marriage, that it's between a man and a woman. And that's the way it's always been. That's the way God created 
marriage to be between a man and a woman. And there are people, they, they, they condemn us. Oh, you are uh, this and you are that and, and you have this issue and you have that issue. We're guiltless. But we're still condemned. We're still rejected as being, you know, not quite right in the head or whatever. Back in the Matthew chapter 9. So you have that social condemnation. But then you also have social condemnation, not just condemning the guiltless, but also condemning the good. Matthew 9 and verse number 32 says, As they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. So they condemned the good. Oh, no, no, that can't be right. And it can't be. And we know that can't be right because we didn't approve him first. And you see, you know, rather than, oh, maybe we should find out if maybe we're wrong. No, 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 no. We can't be wrong. Um, and again, we have to be careful about this because we can be condemning to other people because we know that we're never wrong. Right? Yes? Nod your head up and down because you know that's true. Amen. You know that's true. Even when you're wrong, you know you're not wrong. You know it. You know when somebody comes, oh, man, somebody comes to you on the job and tells you you're doing your job wrong. What's the first thing you think? Well, if you know it's so good, you do it. But it's not their job, you know. That's your job, you know. But that's the way we think and that's the way we feel. Even if we're wrong, we just don't want it. We don't want to hear it. You know, we just don't want to accept it. So there's that social condemnation, and, uh, and, and then there's self-condemnation. We have to be careful about this. Over in Romans 14, over in Romans 14, <clears throat> and uh, we're going to read here in verse 14, but there, there are a good many people who assume guilt for something that God does not hold them accountable like there's guilt laying around because someone's not accepting their guilt for something they've done and and this innocent person walks along and grabs that up they see that guilt laying there and they grab it up and carry it with them you say well that's silly who would do that there are a lot of people who do that sort of thing and they feel guilty about something which they had nothing to do with something that is not their issue it's not their problem but they bear the guilt for that, and they feel a self-condemnation for something they're not even involved in. Here in Romans chapter 14 and verse 14, it says, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean to him, it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So here you have uh, Paul talking about, uh, he's talking about things that are not necessarily sin, but things that we have to be careful about so that we don't become a stumbling block to our brother. But he ends up talking about happy is he that condemneth not himself. So he's doing something that is perfectly legitimate, perfectly uh, right as far as the word of God is concerned. But he's saying, oh, should I be doing this? Should, am I being a stumbling block? Rather than coming to the point of understanding this, this is not a stumbling block. This is not an issue. And so he begins condemning himself. And you see that in verses 22 and 23 both. But there's also satanic condemnation back in the book of Revelation. Chapter 12 and verse 10. We see satanic 
condemnation. You know, we don't talk about Satan. We don't talk about the devil very often. Uh, and uh, that is not to say that he is not real. And that is not to say that he is not important and that he is not our enemy. And we, we have to remember it is he that is our enemy, not people. And uh, sometimes we get that confused but he's the one who tries to condemn us and yes he may use people as pawns and people uh, condemn us but we need to be careful not to then turn around and condemn those who condemn us we need to be careful about that we need to understand that many times behind those who are condemning us and making us feel bad making us feel like you know a doormat as it were that look that's Satan that's behind that so our focus Needs not uh, need not be on that individual or that group of individuals. Focus needs to be on the spiritual battle that's going on, on the devil who's using that to try and keep us from being what God wants us to be. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's look at this in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. He's condemning them constantly. He's, look, if you're saved, you have not yet reached perfection. How do I know this? Because you're still here. And so I know this. I, you know, I, I'm not worried about somebody contradicting. I'm not worried about being, you know, proven wrong. But we all, <clears throat> you know, I could say, I could just say we all make mistakes, but really let's be honest we all sin we still sin and the devil is really good to stand there see there you are again one more time here you are right back to the same job all involved in this and he condemns us and then again just like what i was talking about with what some people do with us we hear that condemnation and we say oh yeah i'm no good god can't use me god can use us god can do something with our life you see, satanic accusation can focus our attention on past sin where we can't get past some things that we've done. And this, this a lot of times happens with sin that even is committed before we're saved. Oh, but you don't know what I've done. I don't have to know what you've done. I know what God does. When God promised and said... And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. I know that that means your sins are gone. I don't care what it is. I don't care. And, and But Satan, he'll come along and say, see what you did? See what you did? God can't do anything with you. God can't use you now. God can't bless you. You can't be saved. You, look how terrible you were. That's what Satan does. That's the accusation. That's the condemnation that he brings to focus our attention on past sin. Or even to discount present service. Look, look what you're doing right now. Yeah, you think that's so good? Yeah, but look at this. That's the way the devil works. He always tries to condemn us, to put us down, to make us feel small. And, and really, I'm not saying that we ought to think of ourselves as being great and wonderful. We ought to be humble, but we ought not be crushed. And the devil wants us crushed, where we're useless to God. But he'll also discredit future faithfulness. Oh, you think you're going to do that? You think that God's going to use you that way? You've got another thing coming. You need to open up your eyes and see reality. You can't do that. God can't use you to do that. That's satanic condemnation. And he uses it in every one of our lives. Every day. We've got to be aware of that. And it is the most difficult thing to deal with uh, because Satan assumes the appearance of God and causes great confusion. Look over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And, and it's true, you know, the devil, he came to Eve and he said, yeah, if God said, I mean, he puts himself out there like, I'm trying to help you here. So here's the word of God. Of course, we know what he did with it. He twisted it around. But the devil's not against coming to us 
and saying, I'm the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, you know, you're no good. God can't use you. And look at what you used to do. I mean, man, you know, it's just a wonder you're even saved. Are you even saved? This is what the devil does. And we'll listen to it and say, oh, that's the Lord telling me that. And all of a sudden, that condemnation has borne fruit in our lives. Fruit that God never intended. Here in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 14, And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So <clears throat> that's what the devil does. He condemns us. So we have to be careful. We have to be aware of all these four uh, different areas of condemnation. But here's, here's the solution. Or the solutions. We have four solutions we're going to look at. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. So for spiritual condemnation, we're talking about the condemnation of those who are lost because they are condemned. There's no one lost without Christ who's a pretty good person. There's no such thing. And we can be honest and say there's nobody who's saved who's a pretty good person. Now, in their standing in Christ, there's if they've never sinned. But in reality, we know what we are. And that's what Romans 7 is all about. I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. We know what we are. But God says, no. Their sins and their iniquities I remember no more. But for those who have never trusted Christ, they are present tense condemned. They are rejected by God. As, no, you're not going to enter in. But they're religious, but they're sincere, but they're good people. Doesn't matter. They're condemned. But here's the solution to that. In verse 17 of John 3, it says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. They may be condemned right now, but the solution to that is the coming of Christ. He came so that that condemnation can be set aside. That judgment that's been passed that they're guilty, that they are condemned. That's put aside. And uh, then uh, in chapter 8, John chapter 8, and uh, verse number 11. <clears throat> Here you have the woman who was caught in adultery and brought to Jesus by the Pharisees. And, uh, of course, we, we know the story. Uh, Jesus said, you know, he that's without sin, let him cast the first stone. And then all of a sudden, they all disappear. Not all of a sudden, but anyway, over time, they all disappeared. And so Jesus in verse 10 says, Where is thine accuser? Has no man condemned thee? Verse 11, she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. She was caught in the very act of adultery. And he said, Neither do I condemn thee. Does that make sense? She was caught in the very act. You see, that's the solution to spiritual condemnation is that people need to come to Christ. As long as they stay away from Christ, they are condemned. But as soon as they'll come to Christ in repentance and faith, he says, neither do I condemn you. That's the way it works, and that's what people need. Back in our text again in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So now that condemnation that was is no longer there. It's all gone. And uh, that's that's an exciting thing and uh, something that we all should rejoice in. Now what about social condemnation? Social condemnation, the condemning of the guiltness, the condemning of the good. Those who are just trying to do the right thing, and yet they're condemned, they're judged as if they're doing the wrong thing. Romans 14, verse 1, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not the doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. <clears throat> he that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. 
And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. As it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So as far as, as uh, social condemnation, the first thing that, that we see from this is that we need to be sure that we're not guilty of condemning someone else. That's the thing. We need to be careful. And again, since we all know ourselves to be right, it's easy to condemn someone else. Well, that's stupid. Why do they do it like that? Right? That's what we do. You know, you go to a new place, people do things different. You say, these dumb people. Don't they know better? You know, sort of like... <clears throat> My wife used to give the boys gum when we would go to church uh, there in New Guinea. And, and uh, so we had we had back-to-back -back services, sort of like what we have now, except we had them in the morning. And so we'd, we'd go outside, they'd sit, soak up the sun if it was sunny, which was like never. And uh, But anyway, we'd try and go outside, sit down, whatever, whatever. And then we'd go back into the, uh, the school, the classroom that we, we rented for our services. But I'll never forget, there was one time that uh, Jason had been chewing gum. And he had been chewing it since before we left the house. <laughs> so you know, um, you know, it wasn't like rubber anymore. It's like chewing a rock. And so he decided uh, that he was going to spit it out. So he spit it out in the grass, out, out in the grass. I mean, there's not any trash cans anywhere. I mean, just, there's just not. So, you know, everything gets spit out in the grass. Um, so he goes inside, and I am sort of walking behind everybody else, and I notice one of the ladies in the church bend over, pick up that gum. <laughs> yes, she did. <laughs> and went on into the service just happy as a clam. <laughs> and I'm thinking, this is... Uh, not right. Uh, that's just not right. But you know what I said to her? <laughs> Nothing. Not a thing. As <laughs> much as I wanted to. <laughs> see, but see, the thing is, just because we have our way of doing things doesn't mean that somebody else's way of doing things is wrong. And for us, look, for us to set ourselves up as the ultimate judge of how everything in the world is supposed to be that's right. done. That's wrong. That's wrong because what we're doing, we may think it's cute, we may think it's funny, but what we're guilty of is condemnation. Laying it on somebody else. God's not in that. God's not interested in that. Look, we've been set free from condemnation. Why would we turn around and lay that on somebody else? That's not right. That's not God's way of doing things. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians 4. And, and we're going to see something else from the other side. So now we talked about it's not right for us to condemn someone else. But let's look at the other side because people are very easy to condemn us as well. 1 Corinthians 4 in verse number 3. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you. Or of man's judgment, yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet I am not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time, until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. So what we learn from this is that uh, we, on the receiving end of the condemnation, we need to understand that uh, 
Nobody has the authority to condemn us. It's God that's going to judge us. Now, that there definitely, yes, there are some things the Bible says are right, some things the Bible says are wrong. And we need to be sure that we are exactly where we need to be with that. But you know what? If, if we are concerned with ourselves being right, like we ought to be, we're not going to have time to be looking around at somebody else saying, oh, look, they're not doing that right. They're not doing that right. We need to be careful. Very, very careful about condemning other people for what they're trying to do and how they're living their life. We need to be very careful about that because that's not our place because we're putting ourselves in the place of God. But when people are doing that, that to us, we also need to understand, yes, that's not their place, but they don't have the authority to do that. God's the one that's going to take care of you. And so as they condemn us, it's like, yeah, whatever. You know, sort of like, had I said anything to Doreen, the, the, the lady who picked up that gun, had I said anything to her, she would have, oh, yeah, whatever. You know, I mean, she didn't just kept on chomping. It wouldn't have made any difference to her. She didn't care. She thought she found the treasure. So that's social condemnation. Let's talk about self-condemnation. Look over in First Peter. I'm sorry, First John. First John chapter three. Um, so self-condemnation. Again, thinking I'm I'm not fit. I'm not capable. God can't do anything with me. I'm not worthwhile. I don't know why God would love me. Well, I don't know why God would love me either, but I'm, I'm certainly not going to slap his hand away because I don't understand it. But that's what a self-condemning person does. It's like, God, I don't know how you can love me. Quit. Quit loving me. I'm no good. Well, that's, that's we're hurting ourselves if, we, if we're in that situation. 1 John 3 and verse 19 says, And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And so essentially... What, what we find here as far as self-condemnation is we need to let God be God. Let God be who he is. And, and instead of constantly piling on ourselves, I'm no good, I'm no good, when God says, you are precious to me, don't stand there and say, no, I'm not. Let God be God. And when God says, I can do something with your life, don't stand there and say, no, you can't. Let God be God. And so if our heart condemns God's greater than our heart, let him be greater than our heart. Back in Romans chapter 8, let him be in charge. Let him be the one with the final say. Romans 8 and verse 31. Verse 31. Uh, what should we say then? What, what should we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine... Or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The whole point that Paul's making here is that God is not going to condemn something that he paid such a high price for. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about 
how that Christ died, and, and even more than that, that he rose again. How, how is then God going to condemn us when he paid such a high price to pay for it? He's not going to do that. So that self-condemnation, we need to understand, we need to look at ourselves as God sees us. And that is worth the cost, worth the lifeblood of his own son. Think about that for a little bit. That means that God sees us as priceless. That's how he sees us. And so when we start condemning ourselves, I'm no good. We need to remember, wait a minute. What does God think about what I'm worth? We need to pay attention to that. Then, of course, satanic uh, condemnation. Back in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. And they overcame him, talking about Satan. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. So there's two things in, in this, uh, in this particular verse that we see. And that's, first of all, faith in the blood of the Lamb. So we have to remember when Satan comes along, look what you did, look what you did. We have to have faith that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ has taken that away. We have to have faith in the blood of the Lamb, but not only that, but also faithful living for the Lamb. See, and, and this is where Satan can get a foothold in condemnation. Not that we're not forgiven, but that we continue to wallow in that sin. So in, in order to overcome that condemnation of the devil, there has to be faith in the blood of the Lamb. Yes, he's already taken care of that, but then there needs to be that faithful living where we are moving away. Uh, from the sins that so easily beset us. Back in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And verse number 5. Here it says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So, in other words... You know what this is telling us is that we need to get on the offensive. So, oh, they're condemning me. They're, you know, I'm being condemned. You know, this is satanic condemnation is talking about. Oh, he's condemning. We need to get on the offensive. And so those things that he tries to plant in our mind, those things he tries to build in our minds that will condemn us and make us think, I'm no good to God. I'm no good to anybody. I may as well go out and live for the world. Because nobody loves me and nobody cares. We need to go on the offensive and to pull down those things, to cast down those imaginations and those thoughts and those condemnations that he says. Now, how are we going to do that? I'll give you three things. First of all, read the Word of God. Second of all, memorize the Word of God. Third of all, meditate on the Word of God. You say, well, all of that has to do with the Word of God. Yeah, it does. Because that's what we need. And, and actually, more than just reading, more than just our, our daily reading, which again, if you want a daily Bible reading schedule, there's one on the back table. But that's beside the point. But this, where we're trying to pull down the, uh, cast down the imagination, pull down the strongholds, the things that, that Satan's condemning us with, and we want to get away from that. We want to be able to overcome. All right, then we've got to read more than just the normal. Now we need to read topically. In other words, we need to find what the Word of God has to say about